Welcome back to another one of my vlogs. In this vlog, I'm gonna talk about clean architecture. Now this video is gonna serve kind of as a dual purpose video. You're probably watching this on YouTube right now, but I also plan on releasing this as a lecture for my newest upcoming course, which is a clean architecture course on Android. So the reason I can use this as kind of a dual purpose video is I'm gonna give you an introduction to clean architecture, kind of what it's about. And I wanna talk about why it's one of the most sought after skills in the software development industry. Whether you're using Android, iOS, web, whether you're developing games, it's generally a very, very good skill to have. Almost all job postings reference clean architecture. Now, if you were to Google clean architecture, what would come up is a lot of different things, but the first link is probably gonna be this one right here. Clean architecture, the clean coder blog. And if you click this, it takes you to an article written by some guy named Robert C. Martin, and his nickname is Uncle Bob. Well, Uncle Bob is a kind of a kind of a famous guy in the software development industry. He's the creator of clean architecture. Now, if you continue to carry on down with his article that he writes here, this is also included in his book, by the way, I believe it's called The Clean Coder. You could find it pretty much anywhere. Amazon is probably the easiest place. So if you scroll down here, it shows you kind of like some diagrams and he talks about what clean architecture is. So you could read this, but I really think that it's quite abstract. And if you have never heard of clean architecture before, reading this is really gonna not help you at all. So I'm going to, I just wanted to make sure I showed you where it was and like who the inventor of this, this clean architecture is. Now I'm gonna go into an example that I think will be more helpful in your understanding of clean architecture. Clean architecture has a lot of properties that collectively contribute to define what it is to be clean architecture. But I really believe that there's really only two major concepts that stand way above the rest. And those two concepts are number one, testability, and number two, separation of concerns. Now I know you're probably thinking, if, you, if you've heard of clean architecture before, you're kind of familiar with it, you're probably thinking, Mitch, well, um, testability kind of falls under the category of separation of concerns because to be testable, you're gonna want to separate things out. And yes, I would say that, but for the sake of examples and giving you something tangible to go off of, I wanna, I wanna separate this into two categories, testability and separation of concerns. And you'll see in a second here when we actually look at an example. So let's talk about testability. What does it mean to be testable? Now on the screen here, I have one of the most common diagrams in all of Android development. This is kind of the, the general architecture that they recommend to you if you go to the Android documentation. You know, you have the, your, your activity, your fragment, which is essentially your UI. So if you're from some other um, discipline, not necessarily Android, you can be iOS, web, whatever. This is kind of the UI component. Next you have is view model, which is sort of a hub for communication between data and UI. So data is coming in from the repository, it sends it to the UI. If the UI has some kind of an action done, like a button click or whatever, it kind of says, okay, where do I need to send this to? Send it to the correct uh, kind of component in the repository, that kind of thing. Then you have the repository, which is kind of like another hub, but this is for data distribution. So you can see the two other arrows that go off of there is the remote data source and the local data source. So this would be um, an example of accessing the network or accessing a local database cache. So I'm sure, again, you've all seen this before. You should be probably familiar with this. So what does it mean to be testable within this kind of a uh, context of an architecture. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at one of these components and I'm gonna give you an example of what it would look like to implement clean architecture in one of those components and even show you a kind of a, a demo test and what some test fakes would look like. So let's take a look at the remote data source. So I think one of the core concepts of clean architecture is this idea of abstraction and implementation. This kind of concept of abstraction and implementation makes code very, very easy to test and very easy to kind of swap out components. So kind of it hits those two kind of main things that I talked about earlier, which is testability and separation of concerns. So as an example here, you might have uh, an abstraction and an implementation that looks something like this. You would have an interface, say remote data source. Then you, you would have all of the functions in that interface that define what it can do, what that remote data source, the type of actions that it can do. So in this example, we have kind of a classic get method, which returns a list of data. In this case, I have a list of notes because I'm building a note taking application in my clean architecture course. Then we have insert, which obviously inserts that note into the database. We have delete and then update, which I don't think I need to tell you what those do. So then over on the implementation side of the world, we have a class that is named very similarly to the interface. It says class remote data source implementation because it is the implementation of that 
that abstraction, you can see that it does implement the interface. So it's implementing the remote data source and then it's overriding all of the functions. So the difference here is that it takes a, a dependency, which is the web service. So this could be in the context of Android development, like your retrofit service or something like that. And then you have all of the corresponding functions of getting that data from the networks. Now you might be thinking, what, what, what the hell is the point of that? Why, why create that extra kind of layer of ab abstraction because you've essentially just inserted another layer between the remote data source and the web service. That's really all you've done here. Well, as I said at the beginning of this video, there's two major concepts. Number one is testability. Number two is separation of concerns. Now let's, let's take a look at an example of why this is more testable than if you didn't have the abstraction and implement the abstraction. So I will go to the next slide and we can take a look at this test. So the class here is called remote data source test. And I'm gonna go through this line by line just so you can kind of get a, get a grasp of what's happening here. So the first value here is the remote data source. This is what you would call the system in test. Whenever you build a test class, you wanna to try to right away define exactly what you're testing. What is the class that you are testing? So the system in test here is the remote data source. So the second variable here is the web service because of course we know that our remote data source implementation has a dependency. That dependency is the web service. So we are gonna need a web service. And you can see up here that I've defined it as a fake web service. Now I haven't showed you this class yet but I'm gonna in just a second, so just hang on. Then inside of the init method, you initialize your remote data source. Notice that I'm initializing the implementation not the interface, obviously, because you can't instantiate an interface. And then you have a test function down here, um, which I'll actually come back to. I want to talk about this fake web service before I move on to the test. So when it comes to testing, you need the ability to build either test fakes or mocks. So an example of a mock would be something you build with like a mocking library. Something like with Android, you can use Mockito or Mock, Mock.io, which is what I prefer. I'm sure there's others too, but those are just kind of the big two that most people use. Um, I prefer test fakes and I'm, and I haven't talked about test fakes or how to build them yet, but let me show you an example and then I'll tell you why I prefer test fakes. So here's an example of what that fake web service class would look like. I would have a private value, which is a hash map, which takes a string as a key and a note as a value. And then it's, you can see that it's extending or it's implementing the web service interface. So just to kind of remind you, let me go back to the previous slide. Notice that that uh, web service is defined at the top is of type web service and it's it's um, being its actual implementation is fake web service. So let's go back to that, that class definition. So just like the implementation and the abstraction of our remote data source, this is kind of, you can think of this as the same thing. The fake web service is the implementation of the web service. And then you have functions that do the corresponding actions. So again, we have get, insert, delete, and update. But instead of accessing the network, we are just accessing that local data set. So this is basically mimicking what the server would do. Because essentially what a server is, it's, it's just a place that holds data and you can access it, insert new data, delete data, update data. So that's exactly what this class does right here. This is what you would use in the test to simulate a network. So now that we have this kind of fake web service, we know that we don't need an actual network. So we don't need to access a real server. We can just pretend for our, our test sake and we can build this fake web service. Okay, so let's take a look at this one test function that I wrote down here. It's called insert data and then it says confirm inserted. So when writing tests, uh, you know, if you don't know anything about testing, this is generally how you want to name things. You want to say like, what the test is gonna do, like the action it's gonna take, and then the expected result or what you're gonna to do to check that result. So here I'm saying I'm inserting data and then I'm gonna confirm that it was inserted. So those are the two things that this test is gonna do. So I'm instantiating a new note object. It has some ID, some title, some body, doesn't matter, remember this is just a test. Then I'm gonna say remote data source dot insert, insert that new note. So that would be the insert part of the test. And then I just wanna confirm that it's working. So I would say value notes, get the notes from the remote data source. And then I would write an assertion. There's many different types of assertions, but the one that I chose to use here is just assert that this this statement is true, that the notes that you got from the network contain the new note that I just inserted. That would be a great example of a simple test to insert a note into the network and then confirm that it was inserted. Now let's talk about separation of concerns. And I know that there's a bunch of other contributing factors that contribute to clean architecture as a whole. But again, I just wanna reiterate that I, I, I think that the two kind of overarching concepts is testability and separation of concerns. You know, even, even testability technically falls under the category of separation of concerns because 
by se by using separation of concerns, that's what you're doing to make it testable. But I wanted to give you an example, and I still think it's 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 those two things are like overwhelmingly the most important things. Separation of concerns refers to the isolation of different pieces of your application into self-sufficient components. The key concept there being self-sufficient. So if we take a look at the Android kind of architecture diagram that I'm sure you're all familiar with, this is an example, this would be like a kind of a lighter example of separation of concerns. You have like your UI, you have some of your business logic or your, your hub of moving information from your repository to your activity or fragment, which is the view model. Then you have your repository, which holds a reference to your remote data source, your local data source. It's a, essentially a hub also. Then you have you know, your local data source, which could be SQLite, your remote data source, which is probably retrofit in most cases. These are all clearly defined different components of the application, and you could swap these out for different things. Let me give you an example. So for example, maybe you had a server that's hosting all of your data, maybe you're using Firestore, and then later down in the future you say, oh, well, Firestore is getting kind of expensive, I wanna fire up my own server, I wanna save the data on my own server, that way I own the data and I can probably cut down on some costs, whatever the reason. If you have your application built efficiently, you should just be able to swap out your network layer for another network layer. The functions are all defined there because you've defined the abstraction. So essentially you just need to build a new implementation that would access the URL endpoints at your server. So that's that's all you would do. You know, in the best case scenario there, you would have to rebuild a single class, which would only be your uh, network data source class. That's an ideal scenario and that's a good example of why you want to use separation of concerns. Just to give you another example, say you're using the room persistence library for your caching layer, uh, you know that that uses SQLite internally. Say, you know, for whatever reason you decide you wanted to use a different database, uh, you wanted to install some database on the phone and use that locally on the phone for your cache. Uh, essentially, you should be able to just swap out that caching implementation, just like you'd be swapping out the network implementation, swap it in for the new one, all the functions would be the same because you have that abstraction that's defined and that is what the implementation is implementing. So it, it could be as easy as replacing a single class. Of course, your configuration class is because you have to configure the new database, but all of the accessor methods, the getters, the setters, all that stuff should just be the same. You're just swapping out one class for another. And then kind of coming back to testability, after you swap out that class, you, in you know an ideal scenario, you just click run on all your tests and all of your tests would pass even though you swapped out one of the, those components. That is kind of the, the best case scenario for a good clean architecture implementation. Now, if you wanna watch my course on clean architecture, which focuses on the Android side of the world, we're gonna be using MVI architecture, Kotlin, obviously, coroutines, uh, channels and flows. Um, what else is there? Dagger 2, room persistence library, retrofit. Uh, I'm going to use Firebase for the network layer, all kinds of different stuff. If any of that stuff interests you, including clean architecture, head on over to codingwithmitch.com. If you want to be notified when this course is complete, just go over to login over here, click on register and register an account. It takes like 30 seconds. You just have to fill out these four fields. It doesn't cost any money if, to register an account. And if you do register, then you'll get an email when the course is complete and you can go and check it out, watch the course demo and decide whether you want to invest time to watch it. You can also find me on Instagram. My Instagram is coding with Mitch. I post pretty much every day there. Sometimes I post programming stuff. Usually my stories, I post stuff that I do on my off time when I'm not working, you know, things like walking my dog, going to the park, working out, funny stuff that I see happening in the Android world. Um, I also follow a number of kind of funny people and so I, I like to reference them whenever I can in my stories. Uh, just generally stuff that makes me laugh and makes me happy, I, I put on my stories. Now before you go, I wanna give a special shout out to me, to myself, Mitch because yesterday was my birthday. I turned 30 and all I really want for my birthday is for you to hit that like button. YouTube fing hates me for some reason and they don't recommend my videos, probably because not enough people watch them or like them. So if you could do me a huge favor, hit that like button down there. That will help me rank better so that I can help other developers like you or other people who are looking to get into the tech industry and learn more about Android. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one.